Have you ever wondered what it would be like to never die? You'd see years, centuries and millenniums pass in the blink of an eye. You'd see sciences and belief systems rise and fall. You'd see the end of one civilization and the start of a new one, all on never aging and never slowing down and never succumbing to the currently inevitable ending we know as death. A few weeks ago, scientists for the first time successfully restored circulation and cell activity to the brains of pigs that had been dead for some 8 hours. As such, this ambitious experiment has blurred the lines between life and death. The study challenges the long-held belief that brain cells undergo irrevocable damage soon after death by testing the idea that large mammal brains may hold a hidden capacity for restoration. While the activity restored didn't allow for proper revival, the findings have inspired some to question what truly happens when we die. If studies are now contradicting the significance of death, then do we really understand what it means to die? Furthermore, if we can reverse death from such extreme conditions, then could we combine this with our efforts to delay it and ultimately subvert it altogether? Such questions fall under mankind's age-old pursuit of immortality, the ultimate biological breakthrough providing a freedom from natural death. What was once thought to be impossible by God is now no more of an extreme idea than, say, transplanting an organ. All we need is the technological breakthrough, and with progress being made all the time, could we one day dramatically increase the human lifespan by ending aging, and ultimately achieve biological immortality? Sadly, most people aren't fortunate enough to be born in an era where brains can be restored after death and some 55.3 million people die every year around the world and as far as we know are gone forever. These people have come from a state of non-existence through a phenomenon known as life. Life is the condition that distinguishes animals and other organisms from inorganic matter through some telltale processes and functions such as growth, movement, respiration, reproduction, etc. But what defines animals like us from living organisms such as bacteria is what we know to be our conscience. Consciousness is what defines sentient organisms from primitive life. It is the apparent awareness and response to one's surroundings, underpinned by the ability to make choices. This can be as simple as a bird choosing the right branch for a nest, or as complex as the philosophers of ancient Greece pondering the nature of their existence, although we tend to associate consciousness with the latter. Life is an intermediate state between two phases of non-existence. It underpins the transition of energy, but no one knows for sure how or why life originated in the way it did, or how common or rare it may be elsewhere in the universe. We come from inanimate energy to be born, and eventually pass back through into this state, with all of us currently on a path to the inescapable event that is our death. Death is the ceasing of bodily and brain functions to return to a state of non-existence. It is currently an inevitable eventuality for most living creatures, and it is the ultimate barrier that functional immortality would need to overcome in order to make someone truly immortal. There are a few different types of death, which themselves cast doubt as to where exactly the barrier lies. When you die, the first state you will enter into is cardiac death, also known as clinical death. This occurs when the heart stops beating and blood stops flowing, leaving you incapacitated, although the brain can live on for a short period if electrical activity can prevail, and life support machines can sustain you while the brain survives. As such, machines can bring you back from a cardiac death within a brief window if the brain can still function, sort of like unplugging a Wi-Fi router. Power has been lost and it no longer functions, but by restoring power, the internal workings are preserved and the system can continue when revived. But routers and other electronics can go without power for years without effect. For humans, it's much briefer. The grace period is usually about 5 or 6 minutes. If you aren't revived in this time, you will move into a state known as biological death or brain death. This is the stage beyond that is the point where there's no coming back, at the moment. This is where the brain shuts down and all electrical activity ceases, as well as biological processes. This can happen either alongside or after cardiac death. If the brain is perfectly preserved at the moment of clinical death, some studies suggest that the memory center may be the final part to shut down. This could be a key reason as to why almost a fifth of cardiac arrest survivors claim to have experienced what is known as a near-death experience. This can include seeing loved ones, recalling memories, and seeing a bright light in your path as the brain shuts down. But for those that are not revived and suffer brain death, the next stage is decomposition. 
your muscles relax with the ceasing of electrical activity and gases and air escape. The unoxygenated blood then pulls to the lowest level of your body and cools down, and within two to six hours, the body stiffens and cell division stops, allowing bacteria growth to set in. This ends in putrefaction, and should the body be treated and encased, such is the tradition in most societies, it can take up to 50 years for your body and bones to break down completely, at which point you have completely returned to energy in the earth. Alternatively, you may choose to be cremated, and your corpse will be burned to ashes that your family will most likely choose to keep. Whether buried or burned, the entire process adds credence to the following expression. Of those 55.3 million people who will die this year, around two thirds of them will die from the elusive condition known as aging. Aging is one of the most common causes of death in the developed world and is the ultimate eventuality that we accept as an inevitability. It is a complicated process that takes place over the lifespan of humans, animals and some fungi, originating with the emergence of sexual reproduction. It revolves around single cell division when the functional processes that keep us youthful begin to break down. Now that humans are living longer, we are aging more, and so unfortunately, we are spending more and more time in poorer conditions, more susceptible to diseases, less able to move, finding it harder to remember things, it's all rather depressing. There is no actual aging death as it were, but those who die of old age do so because aging has caused a malfunction in one of their critical processes. This could be a significant defect like kidney failure, or a combination of multiple minor factors. Eventually, something snuffs us out, but aging clears the path for the Grim Reaper. No one really knows what causes aging, but leading theories suggest that DNA oxidation may be to blame, causing biological functions to degrade and fail over time. The anthropocentric study of aging is known as gerontology, and scientists are trying to better understand its causes and what can be done to delay and reverse it. Ending aging would be a key breakthrough in achieving immortality. We are born with an insane amount of development still to undergo and babies learn by analysing patterns and eventually the brain is built to become a comprehensive and wondrous tool. As such, pinpointing the perfect place in which to halt the ageing process will be the first consideration in our quest to become immortal. We know that humans need about two decades to become properly independent, but the longer you live, the more adverse effects ensue. If we halt ageing too late, the body will die eventually anyway. Studies suggest that the total cell count in your body peaks and begins to decrease after age 25, so anywhere between 21 to 26 should provide the best opportunity to become immortal. Not every living thing on earth ages. Some animals exhibit what we assume could be biological immortality. Certain species of jellyfish, lobsters and some microorganisms have shown signs that they do not age. While we do not understand this phenomenon in any great detail, it is hoped that further research could be incorporated into current anti-aging research, and that the DNA itself could allow for biological immortality in humans. While not safe from predators or geological events, removing aging as a likely cause of death would strip away an enormous barrier in our endeavour to dramatically prolong our lives. Speaking of unnatural death, that is something else we may need to consider. While it is possible to end aging and extend the maximum age achievable by humans, currently understood to be about 120 years, this would not end death itself. The body would be by no means indestructible, and were you to suffer, say, a car crash or die in an unforeseen event, the effects of the damage would still end body and brain function. This is another grey area. Would you want to be immortal if you couldn't be indestructible? This is just one of a myriad of philosophical questions which underpin the topic. How would we handle our existence? Would we get bored? How long would we decide to study and learn for? Would immortality increase suicide? Does life become meaningless without death? There are also numerous considerations for our wider society. Would we have to limit the maximum age a human is allowed to reach? And furthermore, would the state have to put people down when they became too old? This interlinks with a number of global policy concerns too. Would we face catastrophic food shortages? Would the process of natural selection become unethical either by race or class? Would it cause wars? Or could immortality enable the eternal reign of tyrannous dictatorships such as the regime in North Korea? Death has taken just as many bad people from the world as it has good, and if immortality became available to only the wealthy and powerful, would this mean that we could never escape the clutches of human greed and mistreatment? It might be something worth thinking about, as the anti-aging advent seems to be on the horizon, as human trials for revolutionary treatments are due to begin quite soon.
Throughout history, we have attempted to defy ageing through illusion and trickery. We use makeup to conceal wrinkles and skin blemishes. So-called age-defying skin treatments are available, but these come in the form of fillers or concealers. When it comes to treating ageing at the root cause, we've made less progress. But that was only the case until recently. In the last five years, some revolutionary trials and treatments have moved into the testing phase, as some of them show real promise in increasing the human lifespan. What's more is that, should the clinical trials be successful, these treatments could become available within our lifetimes. These treatments are aimed to not only increase our lifespan, but they would also keep us fitter and healthier within that period. Currently, our elderly years are costly to us. We're sick more, we're more susceptible to viruses and falls, and life becomes somewhat harder. In order to achieve immortality, we would have to keep the body young and youthful. After all, what's immortality if you can't function properly to appreciate it? As mentioned earlier, we have discovered that some animals are genetically programmed to be biologically immortal, but the nature of their advantage is not well understood, and dissecting microscopic animals to learn their secrets, as subjecting them to clinical trials presents as many ethical issues as it does technical difficulties. Instead, scientists have been ethically studying the effects of ageing in larger animals, to try and pinpoint the cause. While we don't have total visibility on how and why it occurs, we have managed to identify a number of biological processes that appear to contribute to the ageing process, and we are starting to create theoretical treatments that could slow ageing, rejuvenate existing cells, and dramatically improve the health of humans so that the increased lifespan is not impeded by illness and disease. The current hypothesised treatments are based around some genes and chemicals we have identified as crucial in anti-ageing. One such chemical is NAD+. This enzyme is responsible for regulating self-care among cells in our body. Given that cells themselves have complex internal parts, it's easy for these to become defective, and not all of them are fully cleared away when the cell dies, and this can lead to clustering. NAD plus stops this from happening, but as we age, we begin to produce less of it. With lower amounts of this in the body, cells cannot be regulated properly, and low NAD plus has been linked to diseases such as MS, heart disease, certain types of cancer, and memory degrading diseases such as Alzheimer's and dementia. Scientists have now managed to separate NAD plus from other cells, and so by supplementing it into the body, the hope is that cells will be better regulated throughout the human lifespan. While NAD plus cannot externally enter cells, we can merge it with other compounds, and through this we may be able to create an anti-aging treatment which could be as simple as buying NAD plus pills from your local pharmacy. Trials on mice have shown promising signs too. Those that were supplemented with NAD plus appeared revitalized and had a slightly increased lifespan. So NAD plus could hold the secret for preventing aging, but it doesn't increase lifespan very much on its own. However, we have also managed to identify some contributing factors in that too. Senescent cells, also known as zombie cells, are cells in your body that die due to losing DNA as your chromosomes are being copied during cell division. These cells do not produce enough protein, which is essential for apoptosis, the process of cells dying by design, otherwise known as programmed cell death. It is understood that the older you get, the more of these defective cells there are in your body. They have been linked to problems with the liver and kidneys. By inserting protein into mice, the ill effects of aging were reduced, and the engineered mice lived up to a third longer than other mice in the trial. This could be a key breakthrough in not only reducing illness in old age, but increasing the lifespan of a human and keeping them relatively youthful as they go. The human body is admittedly far more complex than a mouse's, but pharmaceutical companies are now investing in research into a similar sort of treatment for us, where protein is injected into the cells in order to destroy senescent cells. But if we start stripping cells away, we need to replace them with healthy ones and this initiative underpins our research into stem cells. Stem cell research is somewhat more well known among the general public and it is an area of research showing real promise. These cells are essentially cell blueprints, but like everything else in our bodies, they decline and degrade as we age and can only be found in small numbers in adult bodies in places such as bone marrow. The hope is that stem cells could be injected into the human brain and other parts of the body, specifically in areas that regulate bodily functions. Trials on mice showed that this process enabled them to have more efficient and rejuvenated bodies as they aged. While this treatment doesn't reverse aging per se, the extra time and capacity we have for the aforementioned treatments could be optimised by stem cells. 
The idea is that all three processes could work together to keep people fitter, healthier and more youthful over an increased lifespan. This revolutionary composite treatment is on the medical horizon too. We may actually see commercially available treatments similar to the ones described readily available within the lifetimes of all of us watching this video. As wonderful as these treatments sound, they do not grant true immortality. We can delay the inevitable but we cannot avoid it altogether. This treatment would be perfect for living and looking young well into your 80s and 90s but to be truly immortal, something more sophisticated would be required. With this in mind, some people have started attempting to preserve themselves until the distant future when treatments could theoretically increase lifespans indefinitely as well as the realisation of a number of other currently unknown cure rules. The most common method of preservation is to freeze yourself in a state known as cryosleep. This process pauses ageing for all intents and purposes but it might be because it kills you altogether. When water is frozen it turns to crystals. Given that the vast majority of the human body is comprised of water, some people reject the idea that frozen bodies will ever have the capacity to be revived as the circulatory system, among other vital bodily functions, should be completely destroyed by the expansion and solidifying of water within the body. This is a widely held view, but in 2016 scientists did in fact manage to restore near perfect brain function to a frozen rabbit's brain, further blurring the lines between life and death. Of course, rabbits are far more simplistic in form than humans, but if we are able to do this now, then there is surely hope for the distant future that those who have frozen themselves are hoping to reach. I mean, it's not like they're going anywhere anytime soon. With all of these treatments in mind, it does seem that cardiac death and organic barriers are the main obstruction for real progress on immortality. Take cryonics, for example. We can restore function to a frozen brain but have significantly more trouble in restoring the destroyed circulatory system. Does this mean that the body is an unnecessary dead weight? After all, the mind is all we really need to embrace reality and therefore immortality and ageing seems to affect the body far more viciously and regularly than the brain. So why try and fight ageing at all if our bodies are so flawed? What if there is a way to capture the mind and leave organic existence behind? Life as we know it may always be doomed to end. We can delay the ageing process but eventually no matter how much we keep running it seems that the Grim Reaper will get us eventually. So do we really need the body? With the advancements currently being made in artificial intelligence, 3D printing and neuroscience, some believe we should abandon anti-ageing treatments and focus on achieving digital immortality. This is a complicated science but it has simple aims. If we removed all the organic components weighing down the human body, we could put our brains inside robots or incubators, just like in several sci-fi television series and films. This could dramatically increase our lifespan, far beyond what even next generation anti-aging treatments are offering, however there are a few issues with this. The first is that life in a jar with no limbs or ability to move may actually be quite pointless. What's the point of living if you just sit there? The next issue is that this method of preserving the brain doesn't grant indefinite immortality. Eventually, no matter how well preserved you are, just like the rest of your body, your brain will start to break down and decay. So if the brain cannot be preserved indefinitely in its physical form, then why not create a perfect working copy and upload yourself onto a computer? This may sound crazy and an unfeasible idea, all the while throwing up myriads of existential questions, but it isn't totally impossible. Digital immortality through uploading the brain to a computer is a well-established initiative and has some serious backing. Billionaires, including the world's wealthiest man, Jeff Bezos, have contributed hundreds of millions in funding into this area of computer science and neuroscience. If billionaires are backing this with serious cash grants, then there must be some substance to the idea. But how would it work? Well, in order to copy the brain, we need to understand it first. The brain is an unimaginably complex data unit. Information is coded into the connections between neurons. These connections are created when you associate two neurons by learning something new, as well as in a whole host of other circumstances. If each neuron in your mind was a star, then your brain is a galaxy. It contains hundreds of billions of neurons, each with tens of thousands of connections springing off in different directions, with little consideration of distance and locality. In order to download the brain, each connection would have to be precisely modelled, both in terms of its synaptic detail and its physical structure. We have never managed to scan a brain and we are decades away from the technological sophistication to get anywhere close. But if we could, 
then the resulting deliverable should theoretically behave like a normal human brain, while also retaining the thoughts and memories of the previous owner. The only problem is that we don't know how this would simulate consciousness. We could map the brain to perfection, but would that create consciousness? This all ties back in with the idea that we covered at the start. What is life and what is consciousness, and where is the line drawn? Well, it may be harder to answer some existential questions, but the progress we have made has been promising. In 2015, scientists in Seattle managed to produce a fully functional 3D map of a cubic millimetre of the brain of a mouse. While a cubic millimetre is barely comparable to a grain of sand, the map still had to be made up of tens of millions of images and used an incredible amount of scientific data, with that section of the brain itself having to be cross-sectioned tens of thousands of times. While the model behaved as expected, which is a very positive sign, the process of imaging the human brain would be irreversible. Principally, one day, someone is going to have to volunteer their brain to be completely chopped up in a complicated and uncertain procedure, unlikely to succeed the first time around. Perhaps the first patients could be those who chose to freeze themselves. It's unlikely that we'll ever be able to restore their bodies, so could this be the revolutionary breakthrough they have been waiting in the ice for? Obviously, there would be a very big debate about the ethics of involuntary one-way brain scanning, but if we could do it and it worked, we could upload the patient's consciousness into the cloud, and we would have our first immortal beings. While scientists disagree on what would happen to the consciousness of the candidate, they are confident that if the resolution was high enough, your brain and its connections could be perfectly replicated, and the resulting digital brain could be provided with simulated information which, to you, would feel like reality. This touches on another existential debate as to what reality is exactly, but this doesn't necessarily have to stay online. Even if we can't encase the human brain into a robot, we could download the conscience onto a physical unit, and using existing technology such as synthetic limbs with electrical responses, we could get someone who died up and running again. With possibilities like these unlocked by one scientific breakthrough, it's easy to see why scientists are so keen to get started, but modern methods of brain scanning would take decades and more scientific data than even that of the Event Horizon Telescope to get anywhere close. With this technological immaturity, it's no surprise to see the disparity in what we are trying to achieve and what we can achieve with modern methods. This is most evident in artificially intelligent robots, Bina48 is an AI-driven computer that was created in an attempt to model the brain of the project's volunteer, Bina Aspen. Hours were spent interviewing Bina in order to get a sense of her personality, interests and preferences, and then a team spent five years developing an AI and feeding it information in an attempt to replicate Bina's mind. The robot itself is impressive. It is installed with two front cameras that emulate sight and allow the robot to scan a room, and it also has a microphone equipped with voice recognition software and the developer at the demonstration likened the robot's capacity for understanding humans to that of a three-year-old, which isn't bad for a machine. However, when the robot spoke, you could see just how clear the gap between the complexity of a human mind is and that of a robot mind, and it was very clear to see just how simulated this model of Bina's mind was. But if these advancements are being made right now, then the future should be bright. Or is it? Perhaps it takes looking at the shortcomings of an AI pretender to truly realise the nature of our destined reality if we become digitally immortal. If we look at Bina48 herself, we know that it is a poorly simulated mind, but no matter how advanced technology becomes, this is exactly what an uploaded conscience would be, a simulation. The original conscience is no longer present and exists somewhere else, and no matter how well refined the model becomes, it will always be just that, a model. Think of it like this, you take a picture of a beautiful landscape on your high tech camera, it's a lovely high resolution picture, make no mistake, but there is always some detail lost. Even though to you it appears to accurately represent the landscape, all you are looking at right now, and all you ever have been looking at during this video, is a grid of pixels, specifically pixels that simulate movement in such fine detail that you and I cannot notice its true nature. It's easier to see this problem of simulation and representation highlighted in somewhat flimsy models like Bina48 because we can see just how incapable technology is at representing human intelligence and sentience. Bina48 may be programmed to vaguely mimic Bina Aspen, but it falls entirely flat when trying to be Bina Aspen. Even if your brain is perfectly captured, is that really still you? 
There's a scene in the popular British TV series Doctor Who which I think demonstrates the melancholy side of this quite well. In the episode, the Doctor travels to a library which is being investigated by a team of scientists. Each scientist's suit has a central computer which retains information about the user and when that person dies, the computer creates what they call a data ghost. This ghost is a neural relay of the person from the information the computer has collected and so is able to briefly create a simulated and conscious representation, but then the model breaks down and deteriorates quickly. Obviously, the unfortunate nature in which most of these people die adds to the horrifying aspect of it, but when we see the negative side of robot representation, we must ask ourselves if this is really how we want to end up. Think about it, if you were able to create an exact copy of yourself right now, that still wouldn't explicitly be you. If you could stand in front of your copy, you would recognise it as another conscience. It works and makes decisions the same way as you, but it isn't you. What is the point of immortality if, after you die, a copy just takes your place? Are we confusing immortality with impersonation and illusion? Now let's say, for argument's sake, that heaven exists, an afterlife, maybe nirvana or the underworld, paradise, wherever. What now happens when you die and when your copy dies? If you die while a perfect copy still exists, would you be denied entry to heaven as your time hasn't truly come? What about the copy? Would that be allowed in at the end of its life if you are already there? If it was turned away, what about all the memories and experiences that copy has now lived through? They would all be lost into some intermediate void. Now consider this not a copy of yourself, but of your husband, wife or partner, who has just died after a traumatic and degrading battle with cancer. Could you really love a copy of them, knowing that the real one still suffered and died, and their true form is still dead? Is immortality simply about simulating a moment in time and then living in blissful ignorance? These are the questions that are, admittedly, far off, and perhaps their answers will become clearer as technology to answer them is improved. Perhaps when we understand a little better about how consciousness would hold up in a machine, we might be able to cast better judgement on the more spiritual questions that underpin it. For now though, these questions will remain parts of philosophy as opposed to physics. Immortality is an elusive pursuit in all forms due to the very nature of what we are trying to achieve. By subverting death and escaping ageing, we would be doing nothing short of playing God. We could travel the stars and conquer the galaxy, but death is an inevitability for us all, no matter how far we go, irrespective of creed, colour and conquest. The science of immortality is still yet to be refined, but there are many existential and political questions to answer in the meantime. If humanity was to achieve biological immortality, thanks to the unique DNA of the Hydra, for example, our first priorities would have to be how it could be provisioned fairly without decimating the world's resources. Furthermore, what would we be releasing when we opened Pandora's box? Would it be provisioned by race and class? Would we see developed nations full of youthful and ancient demigods living alongside poorer nations that suffer and starve even more in the wake of rapidly rising resource demands? Perhaps biological immortality is just too unfeasible for the planet that we have currently and should instead be pursued as a part of an initiative to explore the galaxy. In its wake, progress and the study of digital immortality is promising too, but we would need to consider the dangers that come with that as well. If your entire brain was on the cloud, it adds a whole new layer of risk to cybercrime. Hackers could steal from, override and even corrupt and kill off the brains of those they attacked. Hackers may not even be the primary problem either. If an entire nation's conscience was stored on a hard drive, what's to stop the overmind feeding them manipulated and distorted information, so to influence their thoughts and behaviour? Digital utopia would quickly become digital dystopia. These are all questions we may one day have to answer, and there's an even bigger one yet. What happens if we survive until the end of the universe? No matter how long you can preserve yourself for in a computer, eventually the end of the universe and everything that comes with it will end existence. Is questing for true immortality pointless in the knowledge that the universe will one day become a dispersed, uninhabitable mess of entropy? Obviously these are far-fetched questions and to ponder them seems to be somewhat jumping the gun. 
we should perhaps focus on scanning more than a grain of a mouse brain before we start going up against the end of time, but these are just some of the confusing and illustrious possibilities and dangers that are associated with mankind's ultimate conquest. Immortality is the final frontier, escaping the shackles of biology and the pain, fear and uncertainty of death. After all, that's what it's really about, right?